Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's get started. Um, nice to see so many uh, uh, new faces as well as some familiar faces uh, here. Uh, I'm Peter Jennings, Executive Director of ASPE, and uh, I'd like to thank you for coming along to the launch of Strike from the Air, uh, the most recent strategy publication, which, uh, as you can see from the cover, I hope everyone's picked up a book. Uh, quite a large uh, number of our team uh, has contributed to over the last uh, month or so. The purpose of this publication is to provide uh, as uh, deep uh, an analysis as we can of the effect of the um, uh, coalition airstrikes uh, in Iraq and Syria over the first 100 days of the campaign, uh, roughly speaking from early August through to the end of November. Um, coincidentally, about a 1,000 strikes in all. Um, this afternoon we'll have a, a discussion from uh, three of the individuals who contributed uh, chapters to the paper, myself, Mark Thompson and uh, Toby Feakin. Uh, but before we do that, I want to ask uh, uh, Patricia Dias uh, and uh, uh, Daniel Nicola to come to the front of the room to show you what we've done with the development of um, some uh, uh, interactive maps uh, which make it possible for you to analyse day by day the um, effect of the strikes over the first 100 days of the campaign. Um, and just before I do that, I, w I wanted to uh, uh, thank uh, Patricia and Daniel for the huge amount of effort that's gone into doing this. Um, un under this publication uh, now exists um, a database uh, which looks as best we can in an unclassified way at um, each of the strikes as has been reported through um, uh, US Central Command uh, and the Pentagon over the last uh, few months. So a very detailed form of analysis indeed, which you'll be able to look at uh, both as a spreadsheet and in the form of these maps. So uh, Daniel and Trish, over to you. Well, thanks, Peter, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so before we hand over to our distinguished colleagues for the panel discussion, um, Trish and I are just going to detail some of the features of the project um, and some of the accompanying components to the report itself. Um, so as Peter mentioned, the report, which I hope a lot of you will have picked up, uh, examines coalition strategy in Iraq and Syria, ISIL's evolution and its military actions in 2014, developing the international coalition, the cost of operations against ISIL, the land force advise and assist mission, ISIL and international terrorism, and the first 100 days of the airstrike campaign, according to the data. Um, but accompanying the report, we've also got a comprehensive uh, interactive map of all coalition airstrikes supported by US Central Command until the time of writing. Um, an airstrikes database which collates all the information in the most comprehensive way, so far as we can tell, available uh, in the open source sphere, and a series of maps that we uh, specially commissioned from this, this research effort. So in total, as you can see from the map being displayed, uh, we're on our count 999 coalition airstrikes till the time of writing, which was 24 November. Um, in Iraq, 564, Syria 435 with the major hotspots being, of course, in Kobani with about 282, border town with Turkey. Uh, near Mosul Dam, 139 airstrikes. Uh, Baji, north of Baghdad, 68 airstrikes. Fallujah, west of Baghdad in Anbar province, 61 airstrikes. And Kirkuk, northeast of Baji, 53 airstrikes. So from this research effort, we were able to devise a, a bar graph of week by week uh, the airstrike campaign. And the overarching pattern that we could discern during the first 100 days has been a relatively limited yet increasing in number airstrike campaign. Since the spike uh, from September 22nd when airstrikes commenced in Syria, uh, the coalition has launched an average of about 94 airstrikes per week, or about 13 per day. And in total, in terms of targets struck, it's a bit difficult to see this graph on, on this screen, um, <coughs> but I guess the, the key points from this uh, at the start of the campaign, the focus on mobile targets, particularly ISIL vehicles, um, and then a spike in, in ISIL infrastructure in Syria when the strikes commenced from 22nd September on ISIL facilities, structures, buildings and training camps, and then also once the Kobani campaign picks up from about mid-October, an increase in the number of ISIL mobile positions in units and mortar positions that were struck. In total, coalition airstrikes have struck 400, 597 ISIL vehicles, 428 ISIL units, fighting positions and mortar positions, 332 ISIL buildings, structures and facilities, 48 ISIL armed com armoured components, including weapons caches, ammunition stockpiles and artillery pieces, 
and 40 ISO oil refineries collection points and stores. And there's some detailed uh, tables in this report that go through blow by blow all the targets struck. So I'll hand over now to Trish who will go through the interactive map online and the airstrikes database. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you all for coming this evening. Um, let me just get out of this. So what we've got here and what we've actually uploaded, if you go onto our online page, you can actually download the publication electronically, but you can also download the database that's uploaded there. The <coughs> database is, uh, it's got three tabs on it. So you've got uh, a methodology section. We've also in, uh, put in some color scale indicators so that you can decipher uh, the certain sort of information that's been highlighted in there and also the airstrikes, of course. So the database, the way it's been designed is uh, to try and provide you as, with as much information as possible in the most accessible manner. Uh, the, the document also contains, um, so if I go in through to the methodology section here, this is also included in our, the back of the publication and it's just a, a guide to how to use the database and how we, we collated all of the data and um, made those inferences and get, got all those statistics out that uh, Daniel just mentioned before. Um, in terms of the database, we've also put in some macros in there so it's easy to navigate through. Uh, we've got some colour scales here, like I said before, they give you the different scales for the airstrikes. This is the database that we've built so far. So you've got all the different columns in here. You've got minimum and maximum strikes as well. Uh, for the strikes, we determine strikes to be um, our primary unit of observation for this study. So we defined it as a kinetic action launched against a single, stri uh, single target or specific group of targets. Uh, this unit of observation doesn't include the type of ordnance dropped or the number of sorties flown. Uh, it's, uh, those, are, those are considered to be variables within the single unit of observation. <laughs> so. Uh, in certain areas, if you go through our database, so I'll just scroll across here as well so you can see the different color, color scales and also for our targets, we've uh, listed minimum and maximum columns uh, because with certain CENCOM media releases, uh, the, the information was a bit vague. Uh, they didn't provide detail on, uh, for example, in, in this section here you've got at least a minimum of one strike but up to a maximum of seven strikes because they, they listed a total number of locations and then also multiple effect and outcomes for those uh, three, three locations. So in this instance, when you're looking at the data, uh, you're looking at a min-max column as well as the, the total airstrikes for that, for that particular report. Uh, we also have all our sources listed on the side if you wanted to follow that through. and uh, it's all in Excel format so that you can extract this data for yourself and uh, uh, use it for your own studies as well. Uh, so that, that's in terms of how you can use, use the database and navigate through that. Um, the, the report contains detailed information in the methodology as well on, on what all of the different colours mean, where, where information hasn't been very clear. Uh, we've, we've put greater than symbols. You've also got a lot of comments all over it that will help you uh, get more detail on the information that's on that database. So from this database, what we have been able to do is then develop our online uh, interactive maps, which you can also uh, go through from the link on our landing page here at uh, first 100 strikes URL. So this, these are interactive maps that were developed by ASPE. You've got four different tabs that you can use here. You've got your main landing page, which, bring, which brings you out onto uh, strike totals per location. So you can zoom in and out on this map um, and get a bit more clarity in terms of location and so on. You've got individual strikes. Now, with this one, this is quite an interesting one and it's very useful uh, because you can uh, zoom right in, you can hover over each dot, click on it, it'll give you all of the information related to that strike. So it gives you the strike location, who made those strikes, the date, what were the effect and outcomes. It provides you the source 
uh, total minimum max strikes if there was a bit of discrepancy there. And it also provides you where available uh, a YouTube clip. So you can click through onto that and it'll open you out and take you into the YouTube clips. So this particular one is of a strike near Tal, I think Tal al Qatar. So uh, you have all of that information there that you can click through uh, from that one interactive map. So I'll just uh, pause that there and we can head back. All right, so all of these dots on this map contain this information. So you can zoom out, zoom in, and um, get all of that detailed information per strike, per location. We also have a timeline. So if we move across to the next tab, you've got your timeline here that gives you the date down at the bottom and it gives you the strikes per location uh, over those dates. So you can see with this what Daniel was talking about before when uh, around the 23rd, 22nd of September when they began the strikes in Syria and you had the coalition join the campaign, um, it became very intensive. We've also included a section for uh, aid drops, so that includes military and humanitarian. Um, you can zoom in and again, like the individual strikes, you can click you can click on a particular aid drop. This is a humanitarian drop and you can scroll down and it gives you all the information, what was dropped, when it was dropped and the place it was dropped at. So from this page, t sorry, from this page too, you can also just navigate back to your main landing page there which contains all of the information to do with the report, um, the Excel database, that it also has links for your maps for you to, to get those maps down. And um, yeah, so if, if you have any questions relating to the data, you can come see myself and Daniel after the event and we can help uh, explain things a bit, bit more in detail if you have any questions. So thank you very much. I'll pass it on to PJ. I don't think we'll be having the second 100 days, but we, we might have the first year uh, as the next report, <laughs> which will continue the, um, uh, continue the exercise. Uh, and in effect, if you, if you um, uh, just watch uh, online the run through of the campaign, you will see how it has shifted, uh, where the particular emphasis has been in terms of uh, coalition priority over time. Um, some quite interesting deductions can be made simply by watching the pattern of that over, over the first 100 days or so. Um, at this point, I think what we'll now do is uh, get our um, uh, senior team up uh, to uh, the front of the uh, room, and I'll <coughs> hand over to Graham Dovell, who's going to be our moderator for the rest of uh, today. We're going to do uh, an opening spiel with these three gentlemen, and then we'll throw it open to the audience. So the opening <coughs> spiel, uh, unfortunately, um, I was saying to Peter before that um, in future, before I schedule anything, I'm going to actually check with him what his next report coming out is because unfortunately this report, uh, the context for this report uh, today is quite a sad one and so we're going to start with that uh, to, to give it a very Australian context for this discussion. And I thought I'd start by putting it to each of uh, the panellists um, in terms of where, whether this tragedy in Sydney was... Uh, a damaged fundamentalist, as his lawyers said, or whether he was just a, a crazed criminal, um, it nevertheless speaks to Australian people and to Australian policy. And I wanted, I think, as a starting point, to ask each of them what they think about that speaking to Australian policy. And Peter, we'll, we'll start with Peter. Well, thanks, Graham. I've, I've been asked uh, uh, this question a few times uh, over the last 24 hours about whether or not what we've seen in Sydney is a, is a terror act or, or uh, uh, simply. Uh, the behaviour of, of a deranged individual. My uh, assessment of this is that essentially we have seen an act of terrorism in Australia uh, and I base that on some judgments which I think uh, take the um, incident out of the deranged individual category. Uh, one was a clear intention to link the behaviour of the individual to a uh, jihadist cause uh, through the use of um, the black standard uh, flag. Uh, at the cafe uh, windows. The second was, I think, a clear intent to um, uh, a 
clear intent to uh, uh, gain the maximum amount of media coverage uh, possible, not only with the location of the cafe across from the Channel 7 studios in Sydney, but as we now know, the, um, the, uh, uh, the use of the hostages to actually call various media outlets. Um, I, I think you put those things together and what you have here is something that can legitimately be considered um, a terrorist act. Now that of course is not to say that it wasn't the act of a deranged individual um, and I think it's also worth noting that in many cases the people who are radicalised um, also um, it would seem from uh, the experience of the last few months in um, Canada uh, and New York and elsewhere um, also have a history of previous criminal conduct, uh, uh, co conduct and of, in some cases, uh, uh, mental health um, issues as well. Uh, so these things are not uh, mutually exclusive, and I think they've become actually part of the, um, um, the topology of what a, uh, a, an individual um, actor might uh, might do in a terrorist sense. Okay. Uh, Tony? Yeah, sure. I mean, it, 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 to, to follow that, um, I mean, I think it was important yesterday during the actual course of the operation that you know the police tried to control the information quite quite um, robustly, and 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 that was quite amazing actually. That in the modern age they managed to shut down so much of the social media reporting, um, <coughs> really keep controls on the flow of information that they actually had, um, a, a, and managed to keep that from from escaping. Because essentially what they were trying to do was, if you like, stop the oxygen from feeding the fire of, of the terrorist narrative. Um, you know, when, when you're commenting on these things, it's, it, to be honest, you know, you're coming up with your evaluation of what's ongoing, and it's hard to disassociate what was going on with some kind of terrorist attack, um, because you know this individual had, um, and we further found out once his you know background came to light, you know, he he had made um, a pledge of allegiance of sorts to ISIS. He had tried to associate this with ISIS. Um, we'll get into this a bit later, however much that might actually have confused a number of um, individuals who are operating with ISIS in Iraq and Syria in terms of, you know, kind of looking at his cause and how that all interrelated. Um, they're clearly confused by his Iranian background. But, you know, my assessment in the end was that, you know, it does seem to follow a pattern of what we're seeing, which is propaganda being put out there for wide distribution, for wider consumption, which unfortunately is often found by um, those individuals who are, are, you know, in deep trouble in their lives in, in some form or another, and that's not to show them, you know, huge amounts of sympathy, but they are clearly, absolutely searching for something um, other than what is uh, in, uh, around them. And, and unfortunately, ISIS, their success has been their propaganda that they've made so freely available and accessible um, that, that it's providing that narrative. We can talk about other cases, actually, maybe later on in the UK context where there's a similar profile and you'd have to go back a number of years, but it's not, you know, this isn't in terms of the makeup of a situation like this, it's not an isolated case, and you often find these individuals do have some kind of criminal past, um, maybe some kind of uh, you know mental illness background as well. Alongside that, it's not always the case, but you do find that in a number of cases, um, and and clearly have found something in the online environment that, that attracts them, some kind of Islamist extremist um, ideology. Um, I'll, I'll pause there so Mark can have some input. I think. It I'd like to look at it in a slightly different manner. I think what we saw yesterday in terms of the response from the New South Wales Police was the culmination of a series of investments that both New South Wales and other state governments and the federal government have been making since the build-up to the 2000 Olympics, where we saw initially a, a second East Coast tag and an incident response uh, regiment put in place. And of course, that was built upon and, and continued and accelerated through the events of 9-11 and, and beyond. Um, the point is that you know, we've now seen that Australia does have to be able to deal with these sort of sorts of incidents on the ground. And uh, yesterday it was dealt with by the New South Wales Police. If it had been a larger or more extensive um, situation that had emerged, there were other resources at the Commonwealth level that could have been drawn upon. Um, these have been substantial in, uh, investments at both the state and federal level. I think it's worth remembering that they also bring other capabilities. In the case of the police, uh, this was, and I agree, this was a terrorist uh, event that occurred yesterday, but those same capabilities uh, in New South Wales and elsewhere have enhanced the ability of state police forces to deal with a whole range of circumstances, hostage situations that emerge in domestic uh, uh, contexts quite, quite regularly, and by the same token, 
the capabilities that have been developed at the federal level, which weren't called upon yesterday, uh, have in fact a whole range of military uh, applications which uh, make those investments um, um, ones that deliver in a variety of ways beyond simply the narrow question of terrorism. Toby, I wanted to pick up a point in your uh, paper and follow your thoughts there a moment. I, I think one of the things that struck me in your paper was this image uh, that I saw use of uh, an image of, of three bullets. And the three cartridges, the head of one of the cartridges is a bullet, but the head of the other two uh, cartridges is a, is a pen and, uh, and a thumb drive. So that in the sense that the emphasis, two-thirds of the emphasis, is on the propaganda effect. Uh, and I wanted to ask you what you thought from an ISIL point of view, the propaganda usages of what we saw uh, yesterday and this morning would be? Well, it's interesting, it relates to what I was saying, that I th still think you're finding from, if you like, the ISIS fanboys on Twitter, they're scratching their heads as to exactly what went on themselves, and they're not sure whether this is something to be used for propaganda or not right now. You know, this individual was an Iranian um, a, a, a Iranian extraction, which which doesn't collate very well with with ISIS ideology or backgrounds. You know, some of the the biggest successes that are actually being had on the ground in Iraq right now are being led by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. So, you know, clearly they're struggling and grappling with what what do they make of this and use it as. But in the end, you know, this almost becomes a moot point because you know the propaganda is there and it's for individuals to be found. You've seen from Al Adnani, the chief propagandist from from ISIS. Um, you know, the, 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 the direct messaging is, you know, we, we want individuals from within these countries to strike in whatever way they see fit. It doesn't matter what form that takes. Any kind of attack will create the kind of publicity that we require. So in the end, regardless of whether they want to associate with him and take, make the most of it, it's almost done its job already, regardless. So, um, you know, it, it's interesting to talk about how they'll associate, but in the end, that, that's, you've seen the culmination of this over a number of years, and, and something I've written about in other places too, but, you know, you really see the genesis of this in, in Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and al al laki and how he really did try to instigate this idea that, that, that jihad didn't have to be something where you actually went into theatre or, or blew yourself up, if you like, didn't have to carry out a suicide mission. There were other ways of fulfilling um, that, that mission and purpose. And, and his influence on YouTube sermons and the like led to a number of isolated incidents, um, such as uh, Nidal Malik Hussein in, in the Fort Hood episode in the US, who killed 13 individuals on, on, on a, a military base. Um, and then there was a, a, a lady, um, I forget her first name, but uh, uh, Chowdhury was her surname, and she stabbed um, a UK politician, Stephen Timms, um, in, in a face-to-face uh, -face discussion, both of those citing Al Al Laki and his call for um, actions uh, removed of, if you like, a network group and just calling for some kind of action, whatever that might be. Um, and really what you're seeing now is, if you like, the extension of that to the furthest degree possible, which is literally, you know, do anything you can. Um, and, and really you couldn't access the level of kind of gratuity that you actually currently can now. You now have what's going on in Syria in, in graphic detail in your front room. And I, I mean, I must admit, I, I've tailed off from it a little bit of late because I've almost just become, it's too much, because from following a lot of these guys, you wake up in the morning and you check your Twitter account, and immediately you're confronted with pictures of, of decapitated bodies. Yeah, this is effective from battlefield to bedroom. Exactly, yeah. and it really is, and to me it symbolised that, and I kind of wake up one morning watching this and I thought, actually, how much, of this, how much more of this do I want to actually consume. So backed away from it a bit because it, it, it does become quite all-consuming and, mm. and addictive almost in the way you follow it and look at the narrative that these guys are putting online from the front line. So it's that immediacy now of what's going on within the battlefield and how now you can access that and potentially relate to it, which these individuals are doing, which is, you know, the biggest, for me, the biggest question at a national security level is, is how do governments now begin to alleviate that access or, or how do they begin to slow it down if you like? Yeah, Peter, I mean, uh, governments don't do propaganda, of course, governments do policy. So um, what is the, what are the policy takes? I mean, how do, how is, how do you think about policy to, to respond to that sort of propaganda? It's not all going to be driven by government. I mean, I think something that will need to happen is uh, for the, um, uh, the media more, more broadly to actually think about what is the best way to report this type of uh, incident. I, I agree with Toby. I think there was actually a fairly um, sensible media approach, 
particularly in the consensus that arrived around not uh, reporting the um, various calls from hostages to media outlets within the first sort of um, nine or so hours of, of the siege. But more broadly, I think a question that has to be asked is, uh, to sort of reflecting on Toby's point, is how, how much of this, you know, should the media be putting on our screens when uh, it is clear that there are some people who are not seeing this as, as repellent, but actually seeing it as in some way um, uh, an insight to, to want to become a part of that, um, that combat. And um, I, I think in a tacit way that has um, happened because we've seen over a variety of um, ISIL videos a reduction of the amount of them that are being uh, put online. Um, se separate to that, Graham, I think then is the question, um, how, how do we deal with what is emerging, I think, is uh, you know, clearly the current problem as far as counterterrorism is concerned, which is the role of the so-called lone wolf, the, the individual who has become radicalised uh, probably online um, and is not associated with a complex network which intelligence agencies are able to more effectively target. And there I, I don't have a clear solution to that, but I think in policy terms, uh, as I wrote in the financial review today, I, I think there, there has to be a social answer to this as well as a legal um, and a policing answer. And in part this goes to questions of, um, um, in schools and in universities, in mental health facilities, how are we able to best track what might be identified as some of the traits which give rise to um, ultimately um, people deciding to uh, uh, go and fight jihad. Um, it seems to me this is not something that we've adequately addressed yet, probably because it's a really difficult policy challenge. Um, what my two colleagues have just talked about is, is the way in which uh, ISIL's been using a narrative to try and entice people in. I think it's also worth thinking about the sort of narrative that our own government puts forward after an event like this. And broadly speaking, from, from the government, the state and federal government, and also some of the things that emerged out of social media, I think were very encouraging in stressing the, to recognise the context here of what occurred. There was one individual who's not representative of a community uh, in, in any way, shape or form, and that the Australian community is, is nonetheless strongly committed to retaining an inclusive approach to everyone in the Australian community notwithstanding the sort of event that occurred yesterday. Now let's come to the report. Um, after 100 days, Peter, how are they going in terms of uh, degrading and destroying? I think the overall um, headline judgment is that we've reached a point of stalemate. Uh, there, there is no question that um, ISIL has been degraded, but in a sense that sets a rather low benchmark for what the Coalition might have uh, been expected to achieve. What I think is um, uh, uh, evident from looking at the, uh, the picture of how the strikes unfolded is how, how limited they are, um, how constrained they've been by rules of engagement which have deliberately uh, uh, ensured that there has been no uh, civilians um, injured as a result of, the, uh, of, these, uh, of these targets. Um, and in essence we have a situation at the end of the first 100 days, I, I can say now the first 110 or 115 days, uh, where really ISIL has been able to hang on to uh, the, the vast bulk of territory which it was able to take over in, in northern Iraq um, through a process of uh, infiltration it's been able to exert significant degrees of uh, influence in Anbar province uh, including uh, down uh, and, and including down into um, areas um, south of Baghdad and has been capable of um, uh, effectively um, uh, undertaking a, a regular a daily campaign of, uh, of bombings in, uh, in Baghdad itself. Uh, for me, Syria, I think, is probably the least credible part of the overall coalition campaign. Uh, effectively, there we have a, a strategy which is designed to train uh, what are described as 5,000 um, vetted and moderate um, Syrian opposition fighters. Um, in a training process that could last uh, 12 months or so that may happen in um, Saudi Arabia but hasn't really begun yet. Which means to say that operations using that group might conceivably begin sometime in 2016, the start of a presidential election year. In effect there is no coalition strategy for Syria, it's really a strategy to delay dealing with the problem until a new American president is elected. Um, and so uh, I think while it's fair to say that ISIL has come under significant pressure, um, 
the fact that this has become such a slow campaign and that the US talks about it as taking years uh, to achieve anything is more a comment about the lack of effort in the campaign. I think your line was that it's not shock and awe, it's uh, sloth and pause. Sloth and pause, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I haven't moved away from that assessment from when I originally made it. Uh, Mark, I think your point, which was a good one, is that this is a, a low-cost strategy for the United States and Australia, but also perhaps low-cost means also uh, low effectiveness, low success rate. Well, I think you've got to be careful comparing what we're seeing in Iraq and Syria today with previous military campaigns. And the obvious comparison to make is we're here we are 100 days and it's, it's inconclusive. Where, where, where we are at this point. Whereas the first Gulf War, we had combat operations for 100 hours and then a ceasefire was called. And, and the, the, the reason is that the, the first Gulf War was a force-on-force -force military operation where they formed up Iraqi units. And doesn't the first Bush president look better all the time? He, he does. <laughs> he, his, and his constraint looks wise too. Um, but what we have here is, is we have war among the people. We have an insurgency. We have a very, very complex political problem whose solution is, is, is unclear. It's unclear in Iraq and it's profoundly unclear in the case of Syria. So, so what's, what's occurring? Well, with, with very, very uh, limited use of force at, at low cost and with great respect for uh, preventing uh, collateral damage, airstrikes are occurring concurrent with the, what, what is inevitably going to have to be a, a slow attempt to build up the capacity of the Iraqi military to roll back ISIL mm -hmm. advances and, and regain territory concurrent with attempts to build an inclusive government in Baghdad that can at least have a credible chance at delivering a, a sustainable political outcome there through an inclusive government that provides both um, pr provides a place for both uh, Sunnis and Shia in the governments of the country. And that's going to be a long-term, slow effort if, if it's going to succeed. And I, I think it's worth saying that unlike the first Gulf War, where the sort of Powell doctrine was, we'd have decisive force, we'd know what the outcome was, we'd execute and, and achieve it, this is a situation where the outcome isn't assured. We're just nudging things along as best we can with the resources that are available to the US from a political perspective to try and get a better outcome than would otherwise be the case. And I think it's on the positive side worth noting that the, the fact that we've stopped ISIL from gaining more territory where they can perpetrate more atrocities is a thing worth doing in and of itself. And seeing what the second Bush president gave us, a uh, nudging strategy doesn't look that bad compared to what, uh, what we spent much of the previous decade doing. Toby? Um, I, I, I guess what perhaps part of the, the, the unsaid word here is a sad, isn't it? And, and that any ultimate solution has to deal with that individual, and that's something that the US just doesn't want to get involved in, but knows it's something that eventually will have to be answered. Um, you know, I, mean, I, I read through um, Leon Panetta's latest piece from CNAS, and if any of you get through that and really can make an understanding of what the strategy is that he's proposing, well, you, you've got a better mind than I, because of the complexity of what they're trying to put forward. I mean, you know, even these 5,000 fighters, if they begin to have success, which currently it seems that the moderate forces, if you like, aren't, well, you know, to create some kind of political solution there, there's got to be a clearer connection between these forces and actually the politicians who are present and tribal leaders who are on the ground. And, and, and that in of itself is no easy, there's no easy solution to creating those linkages and the confidence to make those, those two begin to bind. But then ultimately to begin to create any kind of solution, it's got to have some form of removal of Assad from his position. How does that happen? I, I, I mean, can you see Assad really agreeing to some kind of transitional phase um, of, of his, his um, hold on power, which is really, you know, I, I think when I read Panetta's piece that was what he was saying, but you know, just you can't buy the solutions that are being put out there right now, so it's hard to see where it ends up. If you remove Assad from power completely and very abruptly, do you lead, leave a further kind of power vacuum which will be filled with lots of other nasties in its wake? Um, potentially yes. So, you know, well, where's the ideal solution? I mean, with Iraq, you can begin to see, as Mark said, some kind of 
rational solutions on the horizon with Syria, all you can see are deeper quagmires to be embroiled in, um, regardless, if you like, of the course of action. There are no sort of, you know, easy solutions and paths to take right now. Now, on this, bringing it back to the Australian dimension, Mark, um, we've had 20 Australians killed fighting in Iraq and in Syria. We've got 70, roughly 70 fighters uh, fighting uh, in Iraq and Syria, and we're told that those, as they're killed, those fighters are re re replaced by new volunteers turning up. We know that something like 100 Australian passports have been cancelled to stop people going over there. What does it mean that this is a war in which Australians are fighting on both sides? I can't think of a historical precedent where, where, where this has occurred. But Spanish Civil War, but much smaller... Mate, 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 mate well... It, it, it may have occurred in the past. Um, look, look uh, I, I think it goes back to, to what we were discussing before about the, the very potent message that's been put out by ISIL, which is attracting young people to go and, and do this, these, to participate in, in uh, supporting ISIL in their operations in Syria and Iraq. We, we really need to go back and look at ways of trying to stop that message from getting out and trying to counter that message. Um, and at the same time, we have to be diligent to ensure that within Australia we retain the sort of inclusiveness and tolerance that we have. Peter, Australian against Australian? Well, it's, a, it's clearly a, a you know, deeply un, unhappy situation. I, I, I think we, we find ourselves in, in it um, for a variety of both long-term and, and proximate causes. Um, in the long term, um, one can argue about um, you know the, 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 the problems of the Middle East um, f for a very long time, and, and if you haven't read it, I, I recommend Peter Lay's um, study, which uh, we produced uh, um, two or three weeks ago on that. Um, more proximate causes, though, I think ultimately come down to the vacuum that was created by the US in particular, but the West more generally, choosing to ignore the eruption of a uh, a war in Syria, um, because that became the, the, the field in which it was possible for um, ISIL to, to move into, to start to morph from being a terrorist, terrorist organisation in, into being a sort of a quasi-conventional force, to practice its military tactics secure in the knowledge that it was safe from uh, Western attack, and to create the propaganda which has become so attractive to that mm. small group of Australians which, is, which has gone there. Um, we, we now have to sort of claw ourselves back from that, that particular situation. Um, and it may well be that um, uh, the, the opportunity for jihad is starting to look less attractive to that very small group of Australians that, that is attracted to it after the deaths of some 20 uh, in combat. On the other hand, there are a number of people who will find that very aspect attractive as the sort of purposeful end point of going on jihad. So I, I don't see an immediate solution to that Australians versus Australians mm -hmm. problem. And Toby, this is, in a sense, the Brits have probably had even more of a discussion about, about this issue, um, and it's it's one of those areas which really, you, you come back to a whole sort of um, domestic debates as much as they are foreign policy debates when you, when you confront that sort of issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was just mulling over the answer, you know, what's the appropriate answer in this case, and there, there, there probably isn't a very particularly palatable answer. I mean, how easy is it to distinguish between the ethnicity of a combatant when you're striking from the air? Um, I, I mean, that becomes not impossible, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, to identify an individual and say, oh, okay, they're an Australian who's fighting for ISIS, you know, what are our rules of engagement there? So, it, you know, while, whilst it's an, an air campaign, doesn't that become almost a, a kind of it's an interesting discussion, mm. but one that's not going to affect actually the way I think air operations are, 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 are conducted. Um, I mean, ha has there been you know numbers of situations where UK military have found themselves face to face with UK combatants? Yeah, absolutely, um, and, and that becomes a very different issue I think when they're boots on the ground and it's face to face. Um, there, there would be and, and when you have your own nationals putting up yeah. on YouTube pictures of your own nationals, you know, uh, murdering. Uh, I, I, it, 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 again, it comes back, I suppose, to that point about um, war as propaganda and propaganda as war. Sure. Um, I, I mean, I guess you know you're referring to Jihadi John as he's being termed, mm. and, and you know, still as yet, he has not been 
identified and taken out, but I don't think the British government had been in, in, in any kind of uncertain terms saying they're looking to go in and arrest him and bring him back to justice. I think they would like to, but I don't think you'll see that as an outcome. Mm. For me, there is a fundamental difference, though, between when someone's actually in theatre, when, as far as I'm concerned, and this is not going by any legal playbook, unfortunately you're in a war fighting environment. If you've chosen to make that decision, okay, you know, and again, I'm saying I'm leaving my legal book to one side here. But you know, you, you've chosen, you've made that decision to go into theatre. You've chosen to take every consequence that that actually means in terms of taking that decision. My difference of opinion here, though, is as soon as you're outside of that conflict zone, as soon as you're into international jurisdiction, then I think you know there is a responsibility of state to find those individuals, arrest them, and bring them back and put them through a due legal process. My, my, I, I almost turn, you know, almost turning complete <laughs> in a complete circle, if you like. But but for me, once they've come out of the um, the, the, the war zone, if you like, the conflict zone, that's when you know, there, there are responsibilities to arrest individuals and, and bring them back home. Now, we're going to do, uh, as well as giving you all this uh, super-duper digital interactive stuff, we're going to do a bit of old-fashioned audience participation. Uh, and the w one way we're going to do it is we're going to get you to vote on two questions in a minute. Um, so put your hats on and think about these two questions which I'm about to put to our learned panel, and you get a chance to vote on these as well. The first question which I'm going to put to these guys uh, is a quote from David Kilcullen who says, that the, or offers the proposition which I'd like you to think about, uh, that 2014 saw the collapse of the counter-terrorism strategy the West has known since 2001. Quote, we are worse off today than before 9-11 with a stronger, more motivated, more dangerous enemy. Gentlemen, discuss. I can't disagree with uh, Dave uh, Cook-Cullen's estimate on that. I, I, I think that um, it's um, uh, unambiguously clear that ISIL is uh, more powerful, more, more sophisticated in, in its leadership and propaganda than um, Al-Qaeda Al ever was. Um, I, I think it's also unambiguously clear that the Middle East is in a significantly worse state than it was. Yep. Not solely, it, it has to be said, um, as a result of the events of uh, 2003. I mean, I think the Arab Spring has to uh, claim some credit for the disarray that we, uh, we, we see across the region. Uh, um, I, I, I think in some respects we're paying both for the, we're paying a price both for intervention yep. um, and we're paying a price also for non-intervention um, uh, in, uh, uh, in the case of Syria. But the aggregation of all of those things, I think, has created a, a, a dire um, region-wide crisis of um, stability in the Middle East, which is only just beginning to play out and, and, and really only partly relates back to what we're seeing um, in Iraq and in Syria. Um, I think David Kilcullen's correct, but the real question is, what's the counterfactual? What would have happened if we'd done different things in the past? Um, and I think that's a very difficult question to, to answer. Let, let me just observe just how difficult it is to predict what's going to occur in this part of the world. The Arab Spring, pretty much unpredicted. Um, a, a fruit seller in Tunisia um, finds himself put upon by the local authorities, self immolates and, and then you have the Arab Spring, a single event set off a, an amazing series of events through Egypt, through Libya, through into Syria. Think about Iraq itself. We, we uh, went in there in 2003 and we had certain expectations of how, how that operation would play out, including the way in which uh, uh, coalition forces would be received by the Iraqi people. Totally got it wrong. Surprised us entirely. Then there was the insurgency that arose in 2006, 2007. Once again, a total surprise. The rise of ISIS. Nobody, ISIL, sorry. Nobody was predicting this would occur. Once again, a total surprise. The, the fact is, this part of the world is very volatile, and history is an emergent phenomenon. It's not something that can be predicted ahead of time. So what does that mean for us in terms of making policy there? Well, it means we need to be cautious about how well we think we can predict either what will occur if we do nothing or what will occur if we do do something. It, it makes it a very different, difficult place to put together policy with confidence. And I think what we're seeing in, in some sense in, in the approach that the, the, the coalition is taking in this particular iteration of this series of events is a cautious one where they're trying to just push things into a, in a direction to um, um, get better outcomes than would otherwise be the case. 
can we be sure that that will be will be the case that, that we will get better outcomes than inaction would would lead us to we probably can't be sure on the basis of what we've seen in the past given the volatility and uncertainty of the region but we've still got to make a judgment and for, for the for, for what it's worth my judgment is that taking action at this point in time to constrain the spread of ISIL and try and re-establish a stable uh, environment, at least in Iraq, is the right thing to do. Don't. Kind of a situation you're damned if, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Now, I, I read Kilcullen's piece in the Australian, and I, you know, if you begin dividing it up as a national security head, I, I would have divided him up into, you know, as he did, into the international and the national. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think he was incredibly harsh, and, and to be frank, if I was sitting there in counter terrorist command in, in various parts of UK or Australia, I, I'd been pretty upset, to be honest, at what he said. I think, you know, where you can point to failures is an inability of strategy to keep up with the morphing threat, because that is what we do know, is any counter terrorism strategy um, has to adapt to meet the threat. And, and, you know, terrorist groups have shown that they will constantly look at the responses you put in place and try and work out how to circumvent them and change accordingly. We've seen that through the propaganda, we've seen that through the methodologies of attack. It's consistently, you know, governments having to play catch up. So if there has been a, a somewhat of a failure, maybe it's been in terms of being maybe that one step ahead of where the threat is morphing to. Um, and then, you know, the international level in the Middle East, okay, you know, you could point that, that for me, they're two very separate questions in terms of, you know, if there's a fundamental failure in overall counterterrorism strategy. When I say you're damned if you do, damned if you don't, it, it, it plays to Mark's point. I mean, you know, so you don't go into the Middle East, you don't go and tackle ISIS, what are you left with? Well, at first, you know, it seemed that their campaign was really talking about creating a caliphate, um, you know, an Islamic state, um, attracting as many people to that as possible. but. You, you, you fast saw the way that their propaganda was pushing, which was, you know, making uh, uh, thinly veiled threats to Washington, to Rome, and trying to, you, you, you know, really, really, mm. you could have seen if it was left to its own devices, that would have become an absolute hornet's nest. Similarly, you can look at Mali and how if that had been left alone, again, you'd have had a hive of, you know, a training camp for would-be terrorists. So where does the threat then change there? So, you know, I, I, I don't know, I think that's a very easy thing to say, that it's fundamentally failed. That's okay, but give me the solution. How do you make it a non-failure then? Because it's very easy to say that, but, but that kind of sweeps aside all the kind of, um, there, there's been a tremendous effort um, in that case. And, you know, I'm going to say something incredibly controversial here in terms of what's gone on yesterday. But let's, let's think about where we've come from. We've come from mass network groups of multiple individuals being able to create high explosive devices killing thousands, hundreds of people in built up places. And it was abhorrent what happened yesterday. But, you know, therein lies the scale of it now. It's a difficult threat to counter, but removing yourselves from the humanity of the situation, the numbers are very different, aren't they? And, and that is a, you know, it sounds like a very difficult thing to say. But, you know, <coughs> if, if that's the threat, it's difficult. But is that maybe not more manageable than hundreds or thousands of people dying within your capital cities? And, and I would put that as a question to the audience and see how easily they could answer that. All right, well, let's see. this is your first question, and, and in some ways I think this is the easier question, so it gets harder. Hands up those who agree with Kilcullen that we are worse off today than we were before 9-11. So let's see, what would we say? Where's the hard one? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. So I say about, say, just another 20. 25%. Okay, no. Um, say, say 25. All right, hands up those who now think we're better off. Okay. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, Yes, I know it is. Yeah. Hang on. Hey, I'm a journalist. I didn't say it was fair. Errol, you can't fight the wife. And, so what I reckon. Be for us. Yeah. Okay. Well, so what? Uh, well, we we we're saying. What, what are we saying? Come on, you're the boss. How many? Well, a substantial number of you are clearly wrong. That's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, when, well, I'd say the audience is just about evenly divided. Is I that think fair? So. I yeah. Think okay. So. All right. Well, it gets better from here. So we'll, let's we'll do the final question and then we'll throw it open to you. Um, and. Uh, 
one of the people that I always listen to, um, Armin Saikal, Professor Armin Saikal, says that we are seeing in the Middle East a geopolitical tsunami that is re remaking the, the, this world in ways that the French and the, the Brits couldn't in, under colonialism, <coughs> the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, that this is going to be something that is going to reverberate and change maps and peoples for a long, long time. So the question to the panel and the question which you're going to vote on is, should Australia be amidst a war between Sunnis and Shias? Should we be there? Discuss. <laughs> um, yes, I think we should, uh, Graham, and uh, that's because I think that uh, um, uh, I go back to my my comments about the price of non-intervention can be as high as the as the price of intervention. The, the, the important thing is to get the strategy right. Um, my, my view is that um, if, if one looks at, the, at what is potentially at stake in the Middle East, um, I, I think Australia has a compelling interest to want to be engaged along with like-minded countries in order to do whatever we can to prevent that most dire outcome. What's the most dire outcome? In my view, it is um, an outcome where we see ultimately um, Iraq uh, permanently split into three uh, uh, permanent de facto states, a, a Kurdish north, a, a caliphate in the middle, a, a, a Shia south dominated by Iran, um, with the capacity not only to um, uh, move, well, with, with the risk of that um, fraction moving beyond the borders of Iraq to include um, Syria and Turkey. Um, we, we haven't spoken too much about Kobani, but uh, my own view about why it is that ISIL has been um, so interested in investing two months' worth of effort to um, keep the fight going in Kobani on the Syria-Turkey border um, has been to do what it can to foment the sense of a, a pan-Kurdish um, response which helps to cement the idea of a, a caliphate in, in, the, uh, in the central part of um, um, Iraq and Syria. Um, so we have the potential of that fracture happening across um, um, Iraq, Syria and Turkey. Um, uh, we have the only unambiguous winner, I think, in the region being Iran, uh, emerging as the dominant great power uh, within a fast sprint towards a nuclear weapons capability which then starts to completely redraw the picture of the Middle East. Uh, the Saudis would be considering their positions very fast about acquiring a nuclear weapon in that circumstance. That, that is such a dire picture um, that I think um, you know, um, uh, nations like Australia, which are minded to want to try to make contributions to global security, really have no option other than to become involved. Let me answer the second question by explaining why the first question was unfair. <laughs> this is a compliment, by the way. <laughs> um, are we better off? Well, is the West better off from the narrow perspective of a, a, a lesser likelihood of a terrorist attack successfully occurring? And I think in that narrow sense, we are better off. I don't think that anyone could fly aircraft into the, the World Trade Center again. I, I think we've tightened things up. On the other side of the coin, the, the origin of the problem that manifests on 9-11 has, has worsened. The, the circumstance in Iraq and, and, and Syria at the moment is it, it, going to hell in a handbag. There's no, no two ways about it. And in the longer term, um, if, if, if ISIL establishes a foothold and does become a quasi-state of sorts, that represents a resurgence of the sort of problem that we, we felt via terrorism in, in Bali and, and in New York and Washington, but it also uh, has the potential to do all of the things that Peter just described in terms of destabilising the region in very, very adverse, uh, adverse ways for sure. And for that reason, because of the long-term threat of, you know, in effect, if we ask why, why Ben Laden did what he did in terms of 9-11, of it was an attempt, to my mind, to galvanise a, uh, uh, an uprising within the Middle East by, by one means or another. And in a sense, the bastard got away with it. it. <laughs> yeah. The bastard's gotten away with it um, th through, through a whole sequence of, 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 causal, of causal steps. Um, 
but with so much at stake in, in the long term in terms of our own security, in terms of the stability of the region, I think we need to do what we can to try and push things in a more favourable direction. Um, but it's going to be hard because, because what, what is it now, 13 years after 9-11, the United States is weary, um, most of the, the countries that are going to contribute to the coalition are weary, we can't marshal the sort of effort that we did back then. Um, and that's one of the things that's contributed to the strategy we're seeing at the moment. Okay, you need an easier task of trying to follow those two. <laughs> um, what can I add? Um, should, should we be there? Um, I think I'd, I'd defer to what Mark said is, you know, well, what's the alternative of not being there? It's, it's the establishment of a caliphate. It's the, the you know, emboldening of a, of a large um, Islamist extremist group and allowing them free reign to train and, and make their mind up as to exactly where their, their end goals will be. So I, I would say yes, yes, we need to be involved there. But, but in the minds of policymakers and strategists, uh, I would implore, at least in private, that there was an understanding of what the end game would look like, however muddy that might be. And it doesn't have to be a public facing end goal because we know that can sometimes be self-defeating in of itself. But those who are conducting this have a very clear, as clear as possible understanding of, of where they want to actually get to at the end of all of this. Um, and, and I'm not convinced that that's there um, as we presently stand. But without that, then, then you can't really see any of this ending favourable for Western powers or the Middle East at large. All right, so this is the question you have to vote on. Those of you who believe that Australia should be standing somewhere in the Middle East in the midst of this war between Sunni and Shia in this great struggle between Saudi Arabia and Iran, those of you who believe Australia should be there. Okay, that's, that's a pretty clear majority. Those of you who do not think Australia should be there. Okay, so that would be, well, that's very easily two thirds, one third. Right, now you get a chance to have your say, um, and I'm going to take a really wild stab in the dark and say Jim Moylan might have a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I might have a statement. <laughs> no, that, 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 that's, that's not a stab in the dark, Jim, that's a given. Okay, so. Uh, yes, yes, st <laughs> stand up, stand up, stand up, thank stand up. You. Thank you. Uh, my statement is a question. Uh, <laughs> when I first took this boy in hand. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think, I think uh, that, that the, the point that Toby made last is, is a key point. What else would we be, be doing? Uh, the, the, there is nothing wrong with not what Peter calls a holding strategy, because a holding strategy is a, is a term which is not as good as a stabilising strategy. And I think it is the very nature of strategy that you just cannot see the end state in the real world in almost everything you do until you're well into it. Uh, it is the norm that you can't see the end state. If you go back to the Second World War, where we had a clear strategy, didn't we? No, not until about the last year. And we didn't decide to go to Berlin until we crossed the beaches of Normandy. So, I, I, so I'd say that the big thing that comes out of this, I think it's tremendous work, it's fantastic work. Uh, the big thing that comes out of this for me is that I don't think you're giving enough weight. Are you, here's the question, are you giving enough weight to the fact that the real world, very rarely if ever, gives you the ability to see the end state of anything you do when you start doing it? That's a good statement. We'll, we will take that as a statement. Stephen, <laughs> Stephen, I was... Uh, Stephen, just stand up. Please. <laughs> no, no. I don't often... You don't actually often have to ask them to stand up. <laughs> I was uh, going to ask in terms of American uh, diplomacy and strategic effort in the region. What else should the US be doing with its Saudi allies in order to counter the increasing reach of the Islamic Republic of Iran? OK, okay. a statement and a question. Peter. Uh, well, uh, gee, it's, uh, uh, at the moment, the um, entire weight of American policy is, is actually around cooperating with Iran, uh, which I think is, um, frankly, a a big mistake. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm not convinced that 
the Iranian regime is actually genuinely prepared to arrive at a sustainable and believable and verifiable nuclear deal with the US. Um, uh, but you know, you, you have that element, you have um, a sort of fair weather friend type factor applying also with the Iranians um, uh, operating uh, in, in Iraq, which I think again is being completely misread by the Americans, that they see this as help against ISIL, whereas what it really is is about sustaining the division between the Sunnis and the Shia in, in Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, and so American policy on Iran is just completely wrong, Stephen. I mean, I, I wish that it was possible to persuade them to have a conversation that the, the challenge is about how can we work with the Saudis and others to contain the Iranian. But for the life of uh, the Obama administration, I don't think we'll see that. Let me respond to Jim's point, because that's, that's the one that most closely aligns with my earlier, earlier points. I, I think what, what you've said it, it is consistent with what I said about the uncertainties. Um, and, and historically, you know, th th things like the first Gulf War are, are special by exception. It's very rare that you have a very limited and entirely military campaign, especially when you get politics built into it where, where people are making decisions along the way. You have to adapt a a as you go forward and try and strive towards the best outcome that you can um, given the circumstances as they evolve. That's the reality of the world. Okay, so I should respond. Um, there's, there's just a sense, I mean, let me refer back then to maybe the war weariness of, of Western publics. And I think that, you know, unless they are convinced that there's something achievable in what's going on, then I think support could well dwindle rather rapidly. Um, you know, I think we've all referred to the kind of war weariness of, of US public um, you know, certainly the UK had big problems when it was trying to sign off on, um, you know, potential intervention in Syria um, and was defeated in the parliament, you know, squarely from the fact that public opinion just wouldn't stand for that course of action. So I think it's, it, it, I, I understand how, you know, we enter into these kinds of engagements without an absolute end goal but at least an understanding of what we might want to achieve in the near and medium term would, would, would be better, I think. And I don't think you can conceivably say that the US has really identified that. OK, yes, the death of ISIL. Well, OK, I'm not believing that's happening with the current strategy then. Because that only happens when you, 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 you have land forces on the ground, unfortunately. And, and you know, as much as I, I, I would like to believe that you know, the Iraq forces could have successes on the ground, I'm just not convinced by this strategy in, in Syria and how that achieves that end goal. Neil James, be upstanding. Yeah, Neil James from the Australian Defence Association. My question basically is trying to weave the few things together and build on something that Tobias just said. Uh, we've just had the anniversary of Pearl Harbor and they showed Torah, Torah, Torah on cable TV, as they every second for the second. <laughs> and there's that lovely, um, half historically true, half mythical thing at the end where Yamamoto says, I fear we have wakened a sleeping giant and fooling with a terrible result. Um, if we look at this problem grand strategically, from, from the incident in Sydney yesterday to all the problems in the Middle East, our problem is, is that we have nothing like a terrible result. And we need to re-steal ourselves for what could be, uh, thinking grand strategically to take up uh, Jim's point about um, end states, uh, a very long and, uh, and costly struggle. Um, but given all the crap that's been spouted on social media in the last 24 hours, and it, and it has been an unbelievable deluge for those of you that have been uh, following it, is it not now time uh, in Australia uh, to uh, go back to our treachery laws? Uh, we revised the treachery laws in uh, 2002, so if Hicks did now what he did in 2001, he'd have his day in court, and wouldn't that be wonderful? Uh, but there's a huge gap in the law, and this is what comes up um, in the social media struggle, in the it's only intentional acts of treachery in our offence. Isn't it about time we made reckless acts of treachery also an offence, so we get a more common sense debate um, and uh, possibly a, a good basis for a longer term grand strategic approach? Because uh, at the moment, every fool in Australia um, has an opinion and they're spouting them, and we're not achieving anything. All right, you can think about treachery for a minute. I'll take a few more questions, please. Some more questions. Here, please, and then there. Uh, David Goyne, look, I wonder if this comes back to your thing about the air campaign. I wonder if the actual ISIL uh, assault had actually reached hard shoulders before the air campaign even began to take effect. 
and was went, went up against uh, you know Shia areas in the south, hard shoulder. When it ran up against Kurdish areas, and the Kurds appeared initially soft, but when they were rearmed, uh, we've been quite strong since, and actually it reached a kind of a natural limit. So the question then is, has the air campaign since then really done anything to change that? And I would suggest perhaps not. Okay, and over here, please. Just to sort of mark the side from Rima Talami and the military yeah. uh, to the comment there about the, the stretching, I mean, there's the old adage that they say amateurs talk tactics and the professionals talk logistics, so it's quite possible that they, they'd stretch to the point at the end of their supply chain and maybe they couldn't go any further, sort of stretch and burn. But what I wanted to raise was the point about the war weariness, you know, and, and there's a Brit who sort of had 20 odd years with the IRA. We went through a lot of things, no bins in the streets, and you know, and, and our, all our liberties were reduced, you know, which will be a real sadness if it happens here, you know. But I don't think we got war weary because we believed in what, or the general public believed in the campaign. I think the problem is now with the Western sort of general public is that they don't believe in what's going on is right for them. Okay, that's a good question. And one last question. Up the back, please. Um, just to talk about the regional piece again, Turkey's absence from the list of military contributing nations is quite interesting, considering their proximity to Syria, Iraq, the number of refugees over the border, and also the threat that's emanated historically from Kurdistan to the UK. <coughs> Perhaps the panel could uh, touch on whether Turkey's involvement or lack of might be a defining factor in combating ISIS. Okay, that's a good point. Stand up. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think the answer to that is? Why, um, why, why, why is yeah. Turkey not there? Um, I think Turkey might be hedging their bets uh, <laughs> when it comes to Kurdistan. I think they're viewing this threat through the lens of... This is about Kurds, Kurds. Of Kurds, Kurds. Yeah, Kurds. sure. Okay. All right. Um, let's have uh, some thoughts about treachery, about natural limits, about, a ver I think, a very good point about what the public mood is. Uh, and let's use this also as our, our final comments as well. So um, we'll start with Toby and move across. Hurrah. Let's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> start. Okay, on, on treachery, um, I, guess, I guess you've got to be able to prove some kind of intent alongside, you know, general chitter-chatter, which, to be honest, we can be big enough to ignore half of it because, to be frank, it's just utter nonsense, as you, you mentioned there in your opening statement. And, you know, that's what I tend to do with a lot of these idiots online. But it's about distinguishing between the idiots who are stating certain things and actually what their intent is behind those statements. If you can prove intent alongside those statements, well, then maybe you might have a case. I don't have an understanding, unfortunately, of the Australian laws around treachery to be able to go into that in any great depth. But you could well find yourself in a situation which is not impossible to police because you'd be making so many arrests and putting so many people in court that you basically just flood the system. Um, and, and, you know, in, in full intents and purposes, you could create an atmosphere which is, to be honest, um, probably far worse than, than you currently have. Um, you know, part of being in a liberal democracy is that at times you can say stupid things, um, but if those stupid things don't actually lead to a violent act or inciting others to be having a violent act, well, I, I can live with that. You know, you know, we, 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 you know, that's just part and parcel of the kind of society that we've created um, in, 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 in Australia and, and, and you know, the broader Western world. In terms of your point, I, I fundamentally agree about you know, the difference between some of these uh, you know, I grew up as a, a kid in London and, and grew up in and around a terrorist issue which meant that you know, pretty much every, sat every other Saturday one of the train stations that I would travel to would be closed. Yeah, of course it was always annoying that there weren't bins there, but I understood, um, you know, drummed into me from a very young age what the reasons were for that and, and what my responsibility was as a member of the public in London, especially living in and around that threat. And absolutely there was an, you know, a, a kind of stoic um, sense of, of, of purpose, if you like, from the public who were, who were you know, if you like, with the government in terms of what they were doing. But, um, you know, there, there certainly was, um, you know, 2003 in Iraq, you know, there, there was mass um, protest, millions of people in the streets of London saying they, they didn't want this war in their name and it still happened. And, and you know, that, that, that was the fact of the matter. That's what led to, you know, government decisions being made not to go into Syria. Um, 
So, you know, we do reach this point where the public, yeah, absolutely, they are war weary and they need to understand exactly why they're being taken into a particular conflict. Um, and, and, you know, there are serious, there's repair work that needs to be done in the UK and is ongoing in that sense, because without public trust and public commitment, then, you know, it makes any kind of conflict incredibly difficult to sustain. Um, let, let me try and just respond to two of the comments were made. The first, the question as to whether ISIL has reached what in military terms you might call the natural culminating point of, uh, of what they were doing. Um, and uh, that, that's an opportunity, I, I think, to mention the great work that Daniel and Patricia did. Uh, there's a couple of very interesting things in the analysis they've done. One, one is the, the uh, um, comparison of the areas where there's some support for ISIL in the areas that they actually control. And they're, they're not the same. There's some areas that they don't control where they're extensively support. The other very interesting thing the analysis shows is how very early in the, in the campaign, the coalition was very successful at hitting mobile units. Whenever ISIL would form up with their vehicles, wham, they, they, they got hit. Now, in terms of the counterfactual, I, we can't say for sure that the culminating <coughs> point wouldn't have naturally occurred anyway. But the fact that there were areas of support and that we were very effective in stopping them from being mobile in, in formed units gives me some confidence that we have, in fact, stemmed their, their, their movement through uh, Iraq earlier than would otherwise have been the case. So w some, some, some good has been done there. S second, on the question of war weariness, um, you know, th there's a range of things that have contributed to this. One is the, the, the duration in which Iraq and Afghanistan and so on and so forth have occurred without what anyone could call a decisive victory. Okay? The, 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 World War II people were war-weary, and we won that one. Here's one where everything's just been inconclusive and murky. So it's, it's very hard to persuade people. And I think it's got to be said, the fact that there, weren't, that there wasn't WMD found in Iraq absolutely uh, made it difficult for an entire generation of people to accept um, what they're being told about the imperative to take decisive action. And that's something that all future governments have to work against. It's just a fact of history that future governments have to work against. So the sort of argument that Peter made before about what's at stake in terms of Iran and Saudi Arabia and, and the destabilisation of the whole region, we can make that argument, but it's going to be a very hard one to sell to people because it's even one step removed from the sort of imminent threat of, of WMD that, that, that they, they uh, w w were tried to sell before. What does that mean in practical terms? It, it means that policy makers in, in, in the West have limited resources with which to act. They have to act with caution about the, the risks that they put uh, forces uh, up against. They have to act very prudently in the demand on resources that their actions take. It means we've got to be really smart about what we try and do. It just makes it incredibly more difficult than would otherwise be the case. Finally, Peter Jennings. All right, well, three very different questions. Uh, Neil, on, on your point, I, to be honest, I don't have a very good answer for you around the specific point of treachery. I'd need to sort of think about it more, more deeply. But um, I, I would make the observation that we do have a bit of a tendency in Australia to sort of reach for legislative um, instruments when it comes to responding to anything, really. And um, uh, my, my sense is, is that um, Given the last uh, 10 years' worth of, uh, of that uh, development around the counter-terrorism area, we, we, we may have gone about as far as we can sensibly go. Um, and the next stage is um, a much harder task around, um, you know, how, how do we think of ourselves as a society which, which helps to mitigate against that individual radicalisation problem. Um, I'd also reflect on a comment that a, a friend of mine made to me today. What does a person have to do to actually be kept in jail? Um, I mean, I think <laughs> that's clearly going to be a big debate that we'll be having over the next few days. On David's point about um, hard shoulders, um, look, I, I, I think one thing to be said for ISIL propaganda is they tell us pretty clearly what their strategy is. Um, and the strategy of the caliphate is one which does not require them to um, necessarily take territory and. Kurdish North or, or the um, uh, the Shia South, and uh, uh, my sense has always been that um, their their perspective on Baghdad is is less an interest in taking over the town so much as just creating panic in it, uh, and I think they've managed to do that um, effectively very well. So I, I think.
think your point is well taken. Um, on, on war weariness, um, you know, there is no doubt that the US is um, in the lead of a war weary world and um, one can hardly blame them for that. Uh, partly though that the issue is to think about what, what is the time unit of measurement that, that we're going to take here. I mean, I, I, I think the US is still um, a deeply resilient society um, as they emerge back into high levels of economic growth. I think that, that point is, is demonstrated. So I'm not writing them off um, <coughs> anywhere near quite yet, um, although I have rather given up on the second term of the Obama administration. And on that note, I thank you all for coming and wish you a very Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs>